I wanted to talk about three things tonight about Lester Pearson, uh, and they're all areas where you can contrast Lester Pearson with Donald Trump. <laughs> the first is Lester Pearson as a man who transcends the, own, the very narrow confines of his own upbringing and becomes something quite different than you would expect when you take into account where he started. Uh, the second is Pearson as the leader of a highly productive government that accomplishes an incredible amount in a short period of time. And the third is Lester Pearson as a man who appeared to be a weak leader, but in fact was highly effective. So with that, I'll start with this church, Newton Brook Methodist Church. Newton Brook, uh, in 1897, when Lester Pearson was born, was a tiny hamlet just north of Toronto. It's since been absorbed by Toronto. It's now a neighborhood of Toronto. But in those days, it was quite different, distant from Toronto. And I start with a picture of the church because Pearson's father, uh, Edwin, was a minister in the Methodist Church. So this was, the family life was centered around this building. Uh, this isn't actually a picture from 1897. Uh, you can see the power lines that wouldn't have been there when Lester Pearson was young. But this is pretty much how the church looked when Pearson was young. So what was Newton Brook? I found this in an Ontario directory from the year after Pearson was born. Newton Brook, a village in York Township, York County, eight miles north of Toronto, Toronto being the county seat and the nearest banking point. So if you lived in Newton Brook and you wanted to go to the bank, you had to go to Toronto. Three, three miles from Thornhill, the nearest railway point. So if you wanted to get anywhere, you needed to make your way to Thornhill. It contains a meth church. Um, and for the young people in the audience, <laughs> that means Methodist. <laughs> and a public school. There's a stagecoach daily to Richmond Hill. So we're dealing with a period before automobiles. And to Toronto. The population, 275. So a very small community. Who are the, some of the leading citizens in this community? Uh, we have a fellow named Bull who sells implements. We have two blacksmiths. We have a general store, a potter, a carpenter, a carriage maker, a flour mill, and a builder. And if you notice the names, they're all uh, English or Celtic or German. Uh, you're not going to see any Muslims in Newton Brook. Uh, there aren't any Italians or Greeks. There aren't any Jews. A very small community, tightly knit. They're all Protestant. They all see the world the same way. Uh, there aren't any homosexuals in Newton Brook, at least none that come out. Uh, there, aren't, uh, there aren't any divorces in Newton Brook. It's a very idyllic community on the surface. This is Lester Pearson in 1916. How does he get to Salonika, uh, which is Greece now? Pearson's family moves from place to place when he's young. In those days, Methodist ministers could only stay in a parish for four years. He then goes off to the University of Toronto to study the most valuable subject there is in university history. <laughs> See, you're not supposed to laugh at that point. <laughs> that wasn't a joke. <laughs> and the First World War breaks out while he's at the University of Toronto. And he feels that he's missing something, that he should be fighting, that he should be in the war. Not because he's, he's a violent man, not because he has any uh, bloodlust, but because he feels that to serve his country, he should be in the war. And so off he goes, he, he enlists in the medical corps, uh, he goes to the Balkans, the Eastern Front, uh, and he's a stretcher bearer. He's with the Royal Medical Corps, uh, and his job is to go on the battlefield and take the wounded off the battlefield. Uh, so he sees the horrors of war firsthand. After about a year, they recognize that he has talents other than picking up wounded bodies, and so he moves to headquarters. Here he is at the age of 19, uh, where he's working at the headquarters. I don't know why he's not in uniform. I don't know why he's in civilian dress. If anybody knows, please let me know afterward. Um, but working in headquarters uh, is pretty dull for him. He wants to be in the action a bit more. And so he pulls a few strings. His father had some connections, and he's taken into the Royal Flight Corps. And he learns to be a pilot, uh, the only Canadian Prime Minister who could fly a plane. Uh, this is him in 1917. He's now 20 years old. Something important happens while he's in the Air Force. Uh, he meets his commanding officer on the first day, and the commanding officer says, what's your name, Airman? And Pearson says, Le Lester Pearson. He had a slight lisp. And the commanding officer said, Lester, this is a fighting unit. 
we don't have any Lesters here. I'll call you Mike. Uh, now, Lester Pearson was happy to be rid of the name Lester. Uh, and so for the rest of his life, he went by Mike. And his three volumes of memoirs are entitled Mike, the memoirs of the Right Honorable Lester Pearson. Uh, he was happy to shed Lester. Uh, just by comparison, his brother's name was Marmaduke. Uh, <laughs> so it was this, it, apparently, apparently in those days, it wasn't a crime to give your children names like that. The plane crashes one day. Uh, he comes in on a rough landing, he's injured, he's taken to a hospital in London, and as he's recovering, he goes out for a walk one day and he's hit by a bus. And that ends his, his military career. He's sent back home. He wants to get back to the front, uh, but he's not well enough to go. That's the official story, that's what, what appears in his memoirs. His biographer, John English, um, discovered a bit more to the story. Uh, Pearson had what the, the local newspaper called neurasthenia, uh, basically, he suffered a mental breakdown. I think today we would call it post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and he's in very bad shape for a couple of years. Uh, he eventually, the war, the eventually, the war ends. He gets back on his feet. Um, he goes back to the University of Toronto. They give him, basically, they give him credit for the rest of his degree. Fighting in the war is the equivalent of two years of a history degree. Um, I, probably quite a bit more. Um, and he goes off to work for an uncle uh, who's in the meatpacking business, and Lester Pearson becomes a sausage stuffer. Um, now, it seems to me that there's a great deal in common between a sausage stuffer and a, a legislator, um, so there's a certain amount of preparation there. Um, Bismarck once said that there's two things people should never see made, their, their laws and their sausages, um, and this is certainly, certainly of benefit to Pearson. Uh, but his career isn't in meatpacking, he realizes that, and he had luckily had a chance when he was in London to visit Oxford when he was there during the war. And he dreams of going to Oxford University. Uh, he applies, he's accepted, and off he goes. Uh, he studies history there, he has a great time. He's a star uh, at Oxford, not least of which because he's an athlete and he part participates in virtually every sport. Uh, this is Pearson playing for the Oxford team. Uh, this is Lester Pearson right here against the Swiss national team. Uh, that year, Oxford's team was composed almost entirely of Canadians. They beat Cambridge 23 to nothing. Uh, they beat the Swiss national team. Uh, there was some talk about Pearson playing Olympic level hockey, uh, but the Olympics were a couple years down the road and he had other plans. He went back to the University of Toronto, uh, became a history professor, but again, there was this constant sense that he needed to be in the action. So a couple years as a history professor, which is not a rewarding job, He applied to the new Department of External Affairs in Ottawa, wrote a competitive exam, placed first, and moved to Ottawa to become a diplomat. Uh, and that is essentially the beginning of his career as we know it. He is at External Affairs from 1928 to 48. He rises rapidly through the ranks. He's posted to London. Uh, this is Pearson here. Uh, where he serves in the High Commission along with Vincent Massey uh, and George Vanier. Uh, fascinating photo because in this photo you have one future Prime Minister and two future Governors General. He continues to move up the ranks, he becomes Ambassador to the United States and then eventually he becomes the Under Secretary of State for External Affairs, uh, in today's language, the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs. He is drawn into government, drawn into politics. Uh, he enters the Mackenzie King cabinet in 1948, runs for office uh, in Algoma, Ontario, uh, and becomes the Minister of Foreign Affairs. He becomes the most respected Canadian abroad in this period. He becomes the chairman of NATO, he becomes the president of the UN, Secu uh, the UN General Assembly. Uh, this is him in 1952 holding the gavel at the UN General Assembly. And this is where we get to his most famous exploit in 1950, 1957 when the Suez Crisis occurs. There's, uh, the world is torn apart. Uh, there's a war between, on the one side, Britain and France and Israel, Egypt on the other side, and it's Pearson who comes up with the algebra at the United Nations that allows uh, this from escalating, prevents this from escalating into a wi wider war.
It's Pearson who figures out how to get the two sides to, to stop firing on each other and to figure out a way of separating them with, with uh, peacekeepers. He is the founder of the modern concept of peacekeeping and for that he wins the Nobel Prize. This is Pearson and his wife Marion uh, with the Nobel Prize which he has just accepted. Uh, so he comes back from, from Oslo a hero, uh, and it isn't long after that that his government, the Liberal government of Louis Saint Laurent, loses the general election of 1957, and Pearson's thrown onto the opposition benches. He's at this point the best known Liberal in the country, and so it's not a surprise that when the Liberal Party is looking for a new leader, it's Lester Pearson that they choose. He Despite having been in Ottawa for 20 years, more than 20 years, despite knowing the Ottawa scene very well, he was still pretty naive about domestic politics. So when the new Prime Minister, uh, John Diefenbaker, uh, stands up and presents his platform, uh, Pearson stands up and says, well, we've just had an, ele another, we've just had an election. We don't need another election. Uh, I move that the Conservatives hand over power back to the Liberals, given the bad job they're doing. Uh, <laughs> Diefenbaker rips into him, calls an election, and the Liberals are thumped. They go down to 48 seats, which seemed like a disaster in those days, in the pre-Paul Martin, pre-Michael Ignatiev days, pre-John Turner days. Uh, but Pearson sticks it out, and this becomes one of the themes of his life, is resilience. Uh, no matter how bad things are, Pearson just doggedly keeps moving forward. And it's not long before the, the government of John Diefenbaker defeats itself, uh, and in 1963, Lester Pearson becomes Prime Minister. So on to the Pearson government. I want to say a few words about the tone of the government because it's important to understand Pearson's reputation. Uh, this is a government that never had a majority in the House of Commons. Uh, they won the election of 63 and they won the election of 65, but never, never had a majority. It's a chaotic government. Uh, there's always something seeming to go wrong. Uh, Pearson's frequently dis described as accident prone. Uh, in the 63 election, the campaign slogan was 60 days of decision because the Diefenbaker government had been indecisive and Pearson promised a decisive government. Uh, there were two problems with the slogan. One is that the Prime Minister had a lisp and so 60 days of decision sounds decisive. 50 days of decision, <laughs> not so much. Uh, and the second problem was that the government immediately got into all sorts of problems. There was a problem with the budget of the finance minister, Walter Gordon, had to be retracted and then retracted again. Uh, and there were many scandals and it was 60 days of catastrophe, really. Uh, there were many scandals. Uh, most of them uh, were false scandals. Most of them, there was nothing to it. Not a single one of Pearson's ministers uh, was ever convicted of an offense. Only one of them was charged uh, and there was no, no evidence to convict them. I think most of the scandals were overblown. Uh, but it was a period where the new journalism was coming into vogue uh, and where journalists had moved from deference towards politicians to attack. Uh, and I think it went a bit far. The image of, of the scandal-prone government can be seen in a few editorial cartoons. Uh, this is Duncan McPherson, who was the foremost cartoonist of the era. And you have Pearson um, having dropped all sorts of balls, the cabinet shuffle, the Rivard affair. Uh, and he says, and now for my next act, he's going to pull the rabbit out of the hat on Medicare. Uh, this is another series of four. Uh, Pearson is the baseball player. And incidentally, in, he had played semi-pro baseball, uh, the only prime minister who's ever been paid for his af athletic prowess. So this is Pearson um, dealing with the Canada pension plan. The important thing here is that he catches the ball in the end. Right? The important thing is that we have a Canada, a Canada pension plan and that national unity pres was preserved. But the message that most Canadians got was of a bumbling prime minister. Uh, and so there's this, this paradox that Pearson the bumbler gets so much done. Part of the problem was that it was a very leaky government. Uh, the ministers fought each other by leaking to the media. Uh, so at one point, uh, the Minister of Finance, Walter Gordon, said in, in a cabinet meeting, um, it must be very uncomfortable for Peter C. Newman, who at the time was the, the Ottawa reporter for the Toronto Star, must be very uncomfortable for Peter C. Newman to have to crouch under the cabinet table. Don't you think we should give him a chair in the corner? <laughs> 
And Gordon was delighted when a couple of the cabinet ministers peek un peeked under the table to see if Peter Newman was really there. Uh, on another occasion, Pearson threatened that he would call in the RCMP the next time there was a leak of, of cabinet business. And two days later, in the Toronto Star was a report about what Pearson had said. Uh, I might add that this all ended when Pierre Trudeau became Prime Minister and, and quite seriously said that the next person who leaked was going to jail and there wasn't any leaks after that. So the accomplishments of the Pearson government. Uh, I'm sure you know many of them, but I, don't, I, I would bet you don't know how extensive they were. Forgive me for reading them out, just to give you a sense of the extent of the Pearson government's accomplishments. The Canada Pension Plan, uh, the reform of the old age security pension, uh, which included lowering the entitlement age from 70 to 65 and increasing the benefit. The guaranteed income supplement, uh, which ended poverty among seniors in Canada. Uh, the Medicare plan. Uh, extending family allowances to parents of 16 and 17 year olds. Uh, creating the company of young Canadians. The Canada Student Loans Program. Doubling federal spending on universities. Revising the Canada Labour Code, which included creating a national minimum wage, a federal minimum wage for the first time. Uh, collective bargaining for public servants. Uh, the Canada Assistance Plan, which paid for 50% of the costs of provincial welfare programs. Uh, the Agricultural Rehabil Rehabilitation Development Act. The Fund for Rural Economic Development. The Cape Breton Development Corporation. The Manpower Mobility Program. The Royal Commission on the Status of Women, which led to a huge number of reforms. Uh, the creation of a Divorce Act. Up until this point, uh, in most provinces, you could only get a divorce in Canada by Act of Parliament, and divorce was only granted in cases of adultery. So a woman, for example, who had an abusive husband could not leave him. Uh, criminal code revisions uh, to decrim decriminalize homosexual acts, to decriminalize abortion, to decriminalize the sale of contraception were introduced by Pearson's government. Uh, the end of ra racial discrimination in the immigration system, the abolition of capital punishment, the unif unification of the armed forces, uh, the shifting of resources towards peacekeeping, uh, the creation of a Department of Consumer and Corporate Affairs. I've got about 10 more. I haven't even mentioned the Canadian flag yet. I haven't mentioned staying out of Vietnam. Uh, the list is enormous for five years. Uh, there's no other prime minister who, create, who did more in five years than Pearson. No one ev even comes close. Uh, there are prime ministers who were in office for 10, 15 years who didn't accomplish what Pearson did. And the interesting thing about all these items, the flag, Medicare, peacekeeping, is that they're the symbols of Canadian identity. Uh, we very much live in Lester Pearson's Canada. Uh, 50 years after he's gone, for, he's, he's gone from the political scene. So how does this happen? How do we get a weak leader uh, who's able to accomplish so much? First of all, the man has many hidden talents that aren't, aren't, weren't publicly recognized at the time. Uh, he's highly intelligent, uh, very focused, driven, hardworking, an unusually gifted listener. Uh, Pearson was the person who made people feel like he was actually listening to them, and he actually did listen. Uh, he understood the point of view of others. He was genu genuinely interested in other people. Uh, and again, we may wish to contrast that with the incumbent in the White House. Um, a tolerant man, a patient man, um, likable, charming, warm, approachable. A remarkably humble and modest man. Uh, and this comes through when you go through his papers, that he's not caught up in the trappings of power. Uh, very simple taste, he disliked formality. Uh, there's a wonderful story about the proclamation of the Canadian flag. Uh, Pearson was going to London for the funeral of Winston Churchill in 1965, and they decided that they should bring the proclamation of the flag to London and have the Queen sign it. Uh, so this is the Queen's signature, almost totally faded up here. So this, is, this was the only copy made. This is the original, made by a calligrapher. There's only one copy. They get on the plane. It's a military plane, so there isn't the pull-down table. And the clerk of the Privy Council, Gordon Robertson, says, hey, you might as well sign this now, and hands it to him. Well, where, where am I going to sign this? Robertson hands him his briefcase and says, just put it on the briefcase and sign it. And Pearson begins to sign, and just as he writes the letter L, the plane lurches forward. And so I don't know if you can see it. I've, I've blown it up here. 
the L comes out crooked. Okay. Now, Gordon Robertson had worked for several of Pearson's predecessors, including Mackenzie King, and he later remembered that if this had happened to Mackenzie King, Mackenzie King would have had a fit, and Gordon Robertson would have been fired. But Pearson sort of looked at it, uh, gave a shrug, and just tried to continue writing his name. Uh, because it really didn't matter that much. It really was not a big deal. Sorry. He was a remarkably pragmatic man, flexible about all the details. Sorry, flexible about, yeah, flexible about all the details, as long as he accomplished the core mission. And so the flag, this is Pearson's flag. This is what he proposed. Thank goodness he didn't get his way. But for Pearson, the important thing was that Canada have a flag. So if somebody else wanted another design, if you could build a, a majority around that other design, that's great. Let's go with that. Um, the same thing happened with the Canada Pension Plan. The Liberals had a plan for a, a national pension scheme. Quebec had its own plan, and Quebec was going to go it alone. And so there would be one plan for all of Canada and one for Quebec. Well, Pearson came up with uh, the political algebra to save the day. Yes, Quebec can have the Can Quebec pension plan, so long as it's identical in every detail to the Canada pension plan. Uh, and so both sides get what they want. Very creative thinking. Um, so he's, he's flexible and he's creative. Uh, enormously cool under pressure. Uh, in fact, some of his people recount that perhaps he even liked having chaos. Perhaps he liked the crisis because he was the one who could make a crisis work to his benefit. Um, Jim Coots, who was uh, a senior person in his office, remembers that they walked out of a federal provincial meeting on Medicare uh, that had gone very badly. And Coots said, geez, that was a bad meeting. And Pearson said, no, it's worse than that, it was a disaster. And then he smiled. Uh, and now we can get something done. Uh, so I'm not saying that he, he created chaos purposely, but he certainly thrived within chaotic situations. Part of it was because he, um, he had the interpersonal skills. So if there's a fight, he knows how to go in and find the middle ground. Uh, and that, that maximizes his own um, range of maneuver. He's often, by his cabinet colleagues, often described as cowardly. Uh, he backed away from a fight. Um, people would come to him, there was a conflict, and Pearson would try to fudge the matter. Uh, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't address things head on. I think that's unfair, uh, and if you go home tonight uh, and you're still interested, go to YouTube and look up his speech on the Canadian flag uh, in 1964 at the Royal Canadian Legion in Winnipeg. Um, if there was anybody attached to the old flag, it was the veterans. Uh, and Pearson decided to announce his new flag proposal at the Legion's annual meeting in Winnipeg. And he's booed throughout the speech. He purposely sought out a hostile audience to make the speech. Um, if you know anything about how Stephen Harper worked, it was to manage your audience. You only speak to a, a friendly audience. Pearson purposely sought out a hostile audience to make a particular point. Um, so uh, I think a man of, of quite considerable courage. Uh, he was a remarkably good recruiter. Uh, people flocked to him, partially because he played, uh, he played, had a helpless act that he would put on. Somebody would come to him with advice and he'd say, that's a great idea, I just, I don't know that I can do it. Well, I'll help you. Oh, well, thank you so much. So all sorts of people helped Pearson. And there are a lot of people in Ottawa who thought that they had made Lester Pearson. I suspect he had made them, but that wasn't the perception in Ottawa. Here's a picture from 1967. On this same day in 1967, these three men entered the federal cabinet, okay? So you have future Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, future Prime Minister John Turner, future Prime Minister Jean Chrétien, all entered the Pearson cabinet on the same day. Uh, and between them, those three would go on to, to be Prime Minister for about 25 years. Uh, so quite, quite a phenomenal record. And there were many others that Pearson brought into public life who played a, a significant role in shaping the country. What are the downsides? Uh, one of them is that he was remarkably badly organized. He couldn't organize anything. He couldn't organize his desk. Uh, again, Jim Coots has a story about preparing a report for him on the political situation in Western Canada. And he handed it to Pearson, and Pearson said, oh, I'll look forward to reading that, and threw it in the outbasket. <laughs> and Coots said, well, if, if you're going to read it, shouldn't it go in the in-basket? Pearson said, oh, yes, and moved it from one basket to the other. Um, when he hired Coots, Coots, he said, do you want to come work for me? And Coots said, well, what do you want me to do? 
And Pearson said, well, I've got eight empty offices. I'd like you to fill one. <laughs> um, and the prime minister's office in Pearson's year, years had no structure. There was no chief of staff. Uh, it was full of people of enormous goodwill who got along well together and were able to make it work without structure. I think that would be unheard of in the Ottawa of today. I don't think you could throw um, a dozen ambitious, uh, competent people together and expect it just to work itself out. Uh, Pearson was a poor public speaker. Um, there was the lisp that I mentioned earlier. Quite slight. Pe people who knew him didn't comment on it. People who saw him on television noticed it quite a bit. Um, he had this habit of sort of swaying as he spoke. So if you see the old television footage, it's like a pendulum moving back and forth in front of you. Um, he hated definitive statements. This is the old diplomat at play. Uh, and politics is about making definitive statements, right? Um, and so he always came off as sort of mushy and, and muddled. He had the very bad habit of telling everybody what they wanted to hear. So if you went to see Pearson, he would say yes to everything he said, you said. Yes meant you're making a good point. I appreciate the logic that you're bringing to this point. Yes did not mean I agree with you. Uh, and so people would leave thinking that they had convinced the prime minister. In fact, they hadn't. Uh, Keith Davey, who ran his election campaigns, commented that uh, it took him a while to understand that, yes, Keith, if that's something you think you really must do, actually meant no. <laughs> uh, at first, Davey thought that was a yes, but it took a while to figure out that that meant no. After uh, he retired from politics, he went on to become a professor at Carleton University. And of course, if you're a former prime minister, you don't do the things that professors do. Uh, you don't mark assignments and <laughs> draw up reading lists and put things on reserve at the library. So Carleton had to hire a, uh, a, research, a teaching assistant for him, somebody of, of stature to work for a prime minister, and they chose Norman Hilmer, who's now one of my colleagues in the history department at Carleton. And the problem is that Pearson didn't really want to teach. So it was a, course on, a graduate course on international affairs. The students would do the readings, they'd show up for class, and instead of saying, okay, what does the reading say, how strong is the argument, what, what's the approach of the, the author, Pearson would tell a story about Churchill, followed by a story about de Gaulle, uh, followed by a story about Anthony Eden, uh, and then three hours were up. <laughs> and the students, the first time it happened, were in awe, the great man telling these amazing stories. The second time it happened, they were a little less in awe. The third time, they were quite disappointed. We've done all this reading. We want to discuss the readings. And they started complaining. None of them had the courage to, to confront the former prime minister. They started complaining to the teaching assistant. So the teaching assistant, who also lacked the courage to confront the former prime minister, <laughs> did what I would have done. He wrote him a memo. <laughs> and then when a couple of weeks went by and he didn't hear anything back, he went and he said, uh, Mr. Pearson, ha have you seen my memo? Oh yes, uh, I've seen it, I haven't read it, I've got it right here, sit down and I'll read it. <laughs> and he read it in front of Norman Hilmer who was dying inside and at the end he said, you know what Norman, you're absolutely right. I haven't been teaching properly, I should do a better job. And the next class, Lester Pearson walked in and told three hours of stories. <laughs> The chaos in the office, the chaos of the government, the poor speaking style, uh, led to him being underappreciated at the time. So this is a Gallup poll, this is from the pages of the Toronto Star, a Gallup poll in 1968, just as Pearson's leaving office, and they asked people, what are the accomplishments of the Pearson government that will help the Liberals in the next election? 70% can't think of anything, okay? The government that brought in Medicare, the Canada Pension Plan, the, Canada, all, the flag, 70% of Canadians couldn't think of anything. Um, 12 just generally liked the government, 12%. A few mentioned Medicare, Canada Pension Plan, um, national unity, the new flag. 4% could think of the new flag as an accomplishment of the Pearson government. And I think you still see signs of this on Parliament Hill today, the underappreciation for Lester Pearson. Uh, these are the statues of Pearson and, and his great rival, John Diefenbaker. Uh, you have Diefenbaker standing defiantly, the epitome of strength and power, and Pearson sitting, little crumpled, looking very modest, not an inspiring statue as well, at all. Uh, a similar thing if you walk inside Center Block, uh, these are the official portraits, and exactly the same thing. 
Diefenbaker looks like the lawyer, uh, and Pearson, the image is, is blurred almost. Um, the lines are not sharp. He's hunched over. Um, they always portray him with a bow tie, even though he stopped wearing a bow tie when he was prime minister because they tested on a focus group and decided the straight tie did better with voters. Uh, but he's always portrayed with the bow tie that he wore before and after he was prime minister. So to sum it up, Lester Pearson is a transformative figure. He transforms Canada. Uh, he makes the Canada that we live in today and yet isn't appreciated precisely because of the way he went about it. Uh, and so, really, I would suggest that we as voters uh, should be a lot less concerned about the style of the leader and a lot more concerned about the substance. Okay, thank you. Okay. 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 Um, direct your questions to me and uh, Stephen will rephrase them. Okay. So who's first? Right here. When, when I should die, I will be buried in the old Mattel Cemetery up on the hill there, mm -hmm. beautiful spot, and not very far from Pierce's grave. And I should be looking at my wife as well to interesting conversation. <laughs> <laughs> that the committee that runs the cemetery actually, now I don't want to reflect on, on family, I'm, I'm sorry that it may be a little sensitive. Uh, something I did miss when you talk about the downside is this episode that occurred when Professor James, ba uh, James, what's his name, Barris of Toronto wrote a book about Herbert Norman the diplomat who committed suicide in Egypt. And the book was excoriated because, and I don't know whether rightly or wrongly because I didn't study it myself, but certainly there were these allegations that first of all, Mr. Pearson was protecting Mr. Norman. Uh, there was even an event before a committee of the American government, um, Senate committee, where infamously or famously uh, a woman, I forget her name, I think her name was Bentley, uh, pointed the finger at Mr. Pearson. And of course it was in the days of McCarthyism. Uh, but certainly, I don't know whether Barris was a, a qualified professor of history or not. But I think I did launch it book years ago. And, and I think he brought up a lot of circumstantial evidence, which certainly cast doubt on Mr. Pearson's political alliances as far as communism was concerned. Would you care to comment on that? Sure, the question is about James Barrows's question, uh, biography of Herbert Norman. Um, on the issue of Barrows himself, I'm one of only six people in the world that's read his first book. Um, <laughs> because bef before I was a Canadian historian, I was an Italian historian, and he wrote a book on the Corfu incident. And he, he's, a, he's a legitimate historian. Something happens to Mr. Barrows, Dr. Barrows, along the way. I'm not sure what. And he becomes this virulent anti-communist crusader. And the book on Herbert Norman is, is not balanced at all. Um, Pearson's was a, Pearson was a cold warrior. He, he believed that there, was, there were two sides in the world, the, the West and, and the communist side, and he was very much determined 
Uh, he's one of the founders of NATO, which was designed to defend against the so Soviet menace. So he's determined uh, to fight the Soviets or to counter the Soviets. So the idea that he would be somehow protecting a communist within the government is absurd. Uh, it's based on innuendo, it's based on a selective reading of a small number of documents. But if you look at the man's record, there's nothing, nothing to support the suggestion uh, that, that Lester Pearson was defending communists within the Canadian government. Back there, yeah. Absolutely, and actually the expert Greg Dunhees just walked in. Um, the auto pact being the most important, a uh, managed trade agreement with the United States on automotive parts that provided an enormous number of very good jobs in southern Ontario. Uh, but there were others, there were a whole series of, of successes along the way. Keeping Canada out of Vietnam, uh, maintaining Canada's honour in those years was, in my mind, an enormous accomplishment as well. There's a hand up over here. Yes, um, it's, a, it's a difficult issue. Uh, the story is this, um, the Diefenbaker government agreed to take Bomark missiles after it cancelled the Avro Aero. Uh, the Bomark missiles could only be effective with a nuclear warhead um, and Diefenbaker then began to drag his feet on accepting the nuclear warhead for the, the missiles that were already being installed in Canada. Pearson had been against expanding the nuclear club by having Canada accept nuclear weapons. Uh, but came to the conclusion that Canada was getting a black eye in the world by having agreed to take them and then backing off. So his position, which is uh, a difficult position to explain to the public, was that we should, we've given our word to take these missiles, let's take them, and then let's negotiate to get rid of them. Um, very, very difficult needle to thread there, uh, but that's what the government did. Eventually, uh, in the early 70s, uh, the Trudeau government gets rid of them. Um, but it also was a decision that brought about the, the fall of the, the Diefenbaker government. Uh, as soon as Pearson said we should accept the missiles, it created a rift in the Diefenbaker government. And so Pearson once said to somebody that that's the day he truly became a politician. Uh, so it, was, it certainly was a position based on principle, but also a principle that helped them electorally. There's someone down there. Yes. And it, the question is about the way um, uh, Lester Pearson threw Guy Favreau under the bus. Favreau was the Minister of Justice um, who had, it's a long story, but he had denied knowing something that he actually knew. And uh, Favreau, by all accounts, was a Yes. It, it was a cold evening, much like tonight, um, <laughs> when Lucien Rivard asked if he could take the hose in the Bordeaux jail to water the rink, and then used it to escape. Um, and Favreau had been told that there was a problem on a plane flying back to Ottawa from Charlottetown, and hadn't remembered the conversation. Um, 
and denied knowing about it. And then when he realized he knew about it, um, tried to turn things around and it became a disaster. Everybody who knew Favreau loved the man, claimed that he was the man of the utmost honor who had made an honest mistake uh, and Pearson, Pearson threw him under the bus. Um, there's, there's no question about that. Pearson, and this is uh, clearly a failing, um, when, the, when people were in trouble, he let them defend themselves. He didn't stand up for his ministers, and this is the one of the reasons there are so many scandals, a lot of them not real scandals, because the prime minister wouldn't stand up uh, for his people. And you read this in the, the bitterness of the memoirs of Judy LaMarche and Walter Gordon, um, and even, even Jack Pickersgill, who, who never thinks that any liberal has ever done anything wrong, says that Pearson was wrong on Favreau. No, no, Pearson was never in Northern France. No, never, during the First World War, was not on the Western Front. So there wasn't much happening in Greece. Though. That's true. But anyhow, um, the second question, um, uh, was it Pearson was set up to be a new commission? Yes, Lester Pearson established the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism, which leads to official bilingualism in Canada. But even before the Trudeau government enacts the policy, Pearson's encouraging ministers to speak French in cabinet is seeing that more and more documents are put into French. Um, the secretary to the cabinet and clerk of the Privy Council takes a year off to go learn French as an example to the rest of the public service. So it really begins under Pearson. And I think lastly, was it St. Laurent who set up the Gordon Commission or Pearson? It was St. Laurent who set up the Gordon Commission, yeah. That's, that's the question is who, who chooses the, the official portrait, the style of the official portrait. It's not actually something done by the government. Uh, it's done privately. Uh, so I'm doing research right now on Saint Laurent's portrait. The Friends of Saint Laurent raised the money. Um, C.D. Howe went around and raised money among former cabinet ministers. Jack Pickersgill, who was in the Saint Laurent cabinet and was an art collector, chose the, the artist. Uh, and actually, they had the artist do sort of an audition. Um, and later, later in life, I befriended Jack Pickersgill, and when he passed away, his sons gave me the, the audition piece, so it, it hangs in my office, the, the sketch that the artist did when, when trying out for the role of painting the portrait, and then the portrait's painted. So it would have been Pearson's friends who, who commissioned this and had it done. The question, the question is, why did Pearson resign in 68? And this is one of the fascinating turnovers of power in Canadian history. Prime ministers are like heavyweight boxers. They have to be knocked out. Uh, a few of them may take a dive early when they know they're going to be knocked out, but prime ministers don't leave office willingly. Pearson's one of the very few exceptions. The only other one I can think of is Mackenzie King, who leave office when they're still doing well. Uh, in Pearson's case, he had achieved what he set out to achieve. The agenda was done. He had nothing else to do, nothing else to prove. Uh, by this point, 1968, he's in his early 70s, um, and he was done. It's, and it's quite phenomenal, given how few prime ministers are, are able to do that. Now the question is about an article in The Citizen on the weekend by Sean Maloney, I think, uh, saying that Pearson was a racist. Um, first, the, the article is, is making a point, it's being argumentative. It's actually less an attack on Pearson than a, def a defense on Hector Langevin, um, whose building has just been renamed. Uh, I haven't seen the document that Maloney, Maloney cites. I've, been, I've spent many, many months in the Pearson papers reading documents. I've never seen any evidence of any racism on his part. And everything I read is of a man who was very open to others, uh, 
uh, very accepting. And I gave the example earlier that he got rid of the last vestiges of, of racial discrimination from Canadian immigration policies. Um, what I get from reading Maloney's piece is that Pearson was saying to the Americans, don't send black troops here because there are political problems. So I don't know if Pearson's acting on instructions from others. Um, I, I, I'm not in a position to comment intelligently on it. I'd, I'd love to see the, the piece in question and, and know a little bit more about the context. It seems to be more specifically uh, Northern Quebec. Yes, yeah, it was, about, it was about the political situation in Northern Quebec. Um, and then we can have an interesting discussion if, if, you're, if your voters are racist, <laughs> what do you do? Uh, how far do you push back and when do you push back and do you always push back? The, qu the question is about accommodating Quebec and, and the provinces in general. Um, certainly until 65, Pearson's very accommodating, um, trying to hold it all together. Uh, and I think if it weren't for things like the, the compromise over the pension plan, we might not have a country to, today. Uh, this is the period of the Quiet Revolution where Quebec is, is charging off in its own direction very rapidly. Uh, I think if somebody else had been prime minister and, and had said no, uh, to Quebec's demands, uh, things could have fallen apart very quickly. Um, he changes a bit in 65, and this is when Pierre Trudeau comes into, into his life, and he becomes a little more rigid. And so by 68, he's, he's saying, we've done a lot to accommodate you, uh, but you know, you're not going to become an independent country. So there, there, he does have a limit to it. He's not a man who gives up everything. Uh, but certainly, he bends, he, he bends a lot of, uh, quite a ways to accommodate Quebec, and I think for the for the, for the success of the country, for the future of the country. Pierre? So the, fir the first question is about Pearson's relationship uh, with women, um, and specifically Judy LaMarche, who was the, the woman cabinet minister, the woman in his cabinet. Uh, she wasn't the first. Ellen Fairclough in Diefenbaker, Diefenbaker's government was the first woman in a Canadian cabinet. Um, historians tend to boil this question down to one incident. Uh, Pauline Jewett, who was a member of parliament from Northumberland, went to see Pearson in 1965 and said, can I go into cabinet? And Pearson, we don't know what Pearson said from his point of view, we only know it from what Jewett recounts. Pearson, according to Jewett, said, uh, well, geez, I already have Judy LaMarche in the cabinet, I don't know if I can handle two women. Okay. <laughs> and so the conclusion, which is easy to draw from this, is that Pearson was a sexist. He could only envisage one woman in the cabinet. There are, there are many problems with, with interpreting that way. Um, again, you have to look at the whole record, and the whole record is a lot more complicated. Uh, Pearson had friendships with very intelligent, successful women. Uh, one of them, Barbara Ward, uh, the economist, wrote uh, the introduction to the British edition of his memoirs where, he, where she talks about his respect for all people and how much he valued the individual. LaMarche herself says that Pearson never discriminated against her because she was a woman. But LaMarche elsewhere comments on how difficult a person Pauline Jewett was and how she never could get into cabinet because she couldn't play well with others. Um, <laughs> So my guess, if I have to guess, is that Pearson's in an awkward situation and he handles the situation the way he always does by telling a joke. And he happens to tell a very inappropriate joke, but I, I don't think he had a problem with women in cabinet so much as he just didn't want, uh, just didn't want Pauline Jewett in his cabinet. Uh, then the second question was about the flag debate. Um, the flag debate begins, this is the debate over creating a new Canadian flag. It begins in the middle of 1964 and it takes up almost all the time in the House of Commons for the next six months. Uh, very divisive debate. Uh, 
um, highly controversial, many Canadians steadfast in favor of, of the, the old flag, which had only been the flag for 20 years, I might add. Uh, so a very divisive period in Canadian history, uh, and certainly something that made the Pearson government look weak. Um, and as cabinet ministers kept saying, let's drop this, we have more important things to do. And this is another example of Pearson's inner strength. He says, no, no, uh, this is something that was very important to him, and if not for Pearson, we wouldn't have that flag. As soon as the flag is accepted, Pearson walks into Canada and says, okay, the cabinet's relieved. Finally, we've got this flag thing out of the way. Pearson walks into the next meeting of cabinet and says, okay, what about a national anthem? <laughs> And he then takes up the cause of the national anthem. Oh, Canada was not our anthem in those days. We had no anthem. And they begin pursuing that issue. And the cabinet is just so frustrated. And what, what derails that is they cannot get the copyright to the English lyrics. So it's only after the, the English lyrics to Oh, Canada go in the public domain in the, in the late 70s that we can finally get the national anthem in 1980. Yes? The question is about um, the strength of the Pearson government and the degree to which the direction of that government came from the ministers and not from Pearson himself. It's a remarkable government, uh, probably the most talented government in Canadian history. Uh, in that government are four deputy, former deputy ministers. Uh, Pearson himself, who had been deputy minister in foreign affairs. Jack Pickersgill, who had been clerk of the Privy Council. Uh, Bud Drury, who had been Deputy Minister of National Defense, Mitchell Sharp, who had been Deputy Minister of Trade and Commerce, so they understand Ottawa really well. Uh, Walter Gordon is the Finance Minister. Gordon had been the head of Woods Gordon, which was the top firm of management consultants in the country, uh, an efficiency expert who was called in to diagnose the problems in, in Canadian corporations. So just a remarkable cabinet. Um, what we know is that the cabinet was divided. There were people from the far left of the Liberal Party and the far right. But the direction the government takes is, right, is leftward, uh, and that very much comes from Pearson himself. Uh, as he's mediating the disputes between the, the conflicting members of his team, the team he himself had, had assembled, uh, he's pushing it in one direction. On some files, Pearson sets the general direction. On other files, anything to do with Quebec, anything to do with international affairs, Pearson is involved in the day-to-day -day management of the file. Uh, but if you go through his papers, you see very clearly Pearson's stamp every step of the way in, in the general direction and in, on very specific policy files. Yes? Um, how was he able to accomplish so much given that he operated in nothing but minority government? I mean, was there any, did they have to negotiate with the other minority partners much? Or, I mean, I'm so used to, you know, you look at the states and there's everything is red or The question is, how does he accomplish so much when he's only ever operating in a minority situation? Uh, he was lucky in one sense that his opponents were to the left and to the right of him, roughly equally, well, more, more to the right than to the left, but he's got opponents on either side. So he can find a partner on, on if he can't find a partner on one side, he can go to the other side. So that helps. There's constant negotiation. At one point, the government's actually defeated in the House and they wheeze a lot of it, but the government is always hanging by a thread. Um, but it's, it was a very difficult maneuvering. Um, his first House leader was Jack Pickersgill, who was fairly confrontational with the opposition, so they pulled Pickersgill back and, and began a, a period of just constant negotiation with the opposition. Uh, and one of the things Pearson did is that whenever he had a roadblock, okay, Canada Pension Plan's not going anywhere, okay, Medicare, let's work on Medicare. Medicare's going nowhere? Okay, old age assistance, old age assistance is going nowhere, okay, guaranteed income su supplement. And then we can go back to the other one. And so there was just, uh, whenever they hit a roadblock, we can go on to something else. And so there's this constant momentum. Uh, and again, it adds to the image of a government in chaos, um, but it doesn't really reflect the reality.
Dawson and and Pierre Trudeau staring at Johnson, who was fighting the whole time, and his Lester Pearson was perhaps the most compassionate, gracious, clever uh, chair that one can ever imagine. Uh, and I can remember that. Uh, and so that is part of keeping highly skilled and well-trained people, uh, accomplished people, uh, keeping them all in mind. A small question. Um, he brought in these three prime ministers, um, and one prime minister's son brought in. So, I mean, the legacy is, goes on and on. Uh, can you just give your comment of what came after uh, with the Liberals? We all know the story. What came after with the Liberals? Have they ever been able to maintain the social advances that, that Pearson was so famous for? Have they failed in that cause, or have they just kept moving it forward? And would Justin be, be, you know, should we be proud of his efforts? The, the questions on what happened with successive Liberal governments and whether they kept moving things forward. Um, the initiative solves in Pierre Trudeau's period, uh, partially because so much had been done on, uh, in, in Pearson's period, there wasn't a lot left to be done, partially because Pearson you know, created Medicare in broad strokes, but actually putting together the administration takes a lot of time and effort. So uh, Trudeau's left putting things together that, that Pearson had left half constructed. Um, the other problem that Trudeau faces is a global international economic downturn. They just don't have the money to continue the reform project. So reform stalls under Pierre Trudeau. Um, and by the time uh, we get to Jean Chrétien, the government is in e enormous financial difficulty. And much of the effort in the first half of that government goes into sorting out Canada's finances. So no, in, in the short answer is no, it doesn't continue, largely because of circumstances. Um, what happens with Justin Trudeau? Well, that's a work in progress. Um, certainly it's a, a reforming government, and we see that with simple things like having half the cabinet made up of women, uh, an enormous stride forward. Um, the emphasis put on Aboriginal peoples, something that the Pearson government didn't pay much attention to. Uh, suddenly this is coming to the forefront now. So I, th I think it's continuing, but not nowhere near the pace that it occurred in the Pearson years. Point one. Just, uh, I, I was. Uh, I read the Andrew Cohen book mm. on Lester and Pearson, and I was so struck by Peter Peter Newman, who wrote that was like the most inefficient, the most bungling, and and also the, the the need for a long period of time before you can reflect on a government. And I think it was like forty years is just the beginning. You need a hundred years mm. or something like this. So I'm, I'm wondering. Get, uh, Partly because of the last question, how much time do you think you need to be able to assess a government? <laughs> the question is, how much time do you need to assess uh, assess a government? How much many many years need to pass before you can come up with a, a clear assessment? Um, there's the old story about uh, was it Nixon asking Mao Zedong his opinion of of the Chinese Revolution, and Mao says it's too early to uh, sorry his opinion of the French Revolution. And Mao says it's too early to tell. Um, no, no doubt apocryphal. Um, historians, there, there never is a time. We, we keep, we have this nasty habit of continually rewriting things. And so you think the story is settled and then somebody comes up with a new perspective or discovers some new documents and suddenly things are opened up again. And, and you see that over and over again. I just finished writing a book a couple of years ago on Canada-US relations. Well, there are a lot of books on Canada-US relations, but I'm, seeing it differently. Uh, and somebody else, 10 years down the road, will write another one, and it'll be a totally different story again. Um, certainly, it helps when the historians are so young that they don't remember firsthand. They don't have the bias that comes with firsthand knowledge. Um, and I mentioned Greg. Greg and I were in a conference in 1997 for the 100th anniversary of Lester Pearson's birth and there were all the old timers, all the, the great historians of Canada were there and they were writing affectionately about Pearson and Greg and I and two other young historians were writing very cynically about Pearson um, because we saw this bump. Now my position softened and Greg's has as well um, but it's, every generation sees things differently.
one there, one there, and then Phyllis will wrap up. Yeah, the question is whether Pearson's success might come from the fact that he understood the way government worked after having served in government for so long. Abs absolutely, absolutely. This is the government that more than any other understands how the system works. If you don't understand how the system works, it takes a few years to learn it. Um, and if you set yourself up in opposition to the system, uh, instead of trying to work within it, you've got a lot of difficulty. And, and we see this maybe not every day with Trump, maybe it's every hour. But the Trump people banging their head against the system, uh, when you could make a lot work, you know, things work a lot quicker and more easily if you just went with the flow a bit. Yeah, the question is about uh, specifically the Munsinger case and just generally about uh, the dirty tricks in Parliament in this period. The Munsinger case, uh, Goethe Munsinger was an East German um, prostitute who had slept with the Associate Minister of National Defence in the Diefenbaker government, Balsay. Um, clearly a security risk. There was some talk about whether Munsinger was an East German spy. Um, Diefenbaker dealt with it. He called in Balsay. They agreed that there was no problem and life went on. When Pearson was under attack from Diefenbaker in the Commons day after day about a whole bunch of other scandals, he called Diefenbaker into his office and essentially blackmailed him. There's, there's no way around it. Um, if you don't drop this, I'm going to bring up the security risk in your cabinet, uh, which was of about the same magnitude of, of, of the scandals in, in Pearson's cabinet. And Diefenbaker threatened him back, and so you have this situation of the leader of the opposition and the prime minister blackmailing each other, no doubt the lowest moment in Canadian political history. Um, no, it was, it was despicable. There, there's no question about it. I, I, it. It was indefensible. I don't know about um, investigating Eric Nielsen's tax records. I'd be surprised at that. But yeah, um, Nielsen's, Nielsen's memoirs, sections of it are fiction. <laughs> Uh, yeah. 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 I, I, you know, I, I think in this case, um, I understand why Pearson did it. He was at his wit's end being accused of things when the previous government had done the same and worse. Um, and so he thought that he could deal with it by pointing this out to the leader of the opposition. But no, it should not have been done. It was the wrong thing to do. Uh, clearly unethical. You won't, you won't find me disagreeing.